Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, uh, rather cooler than last week's uh, session. Um, I'd like, for those who don't know her, I'd like to introduce you to um, Dr. Anna Barford, um, who is a fellow at the college. Um, she has a particular interest in the ways in which economics and um, in, in the way in which economics and the connections between distant parts of the world can influence people's lives and what interventions can be made to ensure social well-being and environmental sustainability. Um, she, she's joined this evening by Safi Ahmed, who graduated last year with a BA in Geography and, um, and has recently become, so she's one of our very most recent college alumna. Um, <clears throat> She, um, her, dis her undergraduate dissertation focused on the export of plastic waste from the UK to Malaysia. Um, and that took her um, to work with the Centre for Global Equality, consulting on the implementation of new technology as a solution to the global plastic crisis. She's now working alongside Anna, who was her former DOS, um, as a research assistant in CISL. Um, so perhaps you'll both tell us a little bit more about that as we go along. Thank you, over to you. Okay. Well, could I just ask people to put questions in via the chat and then Anna or Safi will pick them up later on. Perfect. Thank you. We, we look forward to talking about this um, at the end. So um, th thank you ever so much, Jane and um, Safi. Also, thank you for, for giving this talk um, with me. This is um, a presentation based actually on what's going to be ultimately three research papers that Safi and I are working on together about how um, mainly companies are transitioning towards a more circular economy, how they're managing to change their ways of operating, or as you might find out in this talk, um, not change them as radically as, or, or as quickly as we might hope. Um, this is work based at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability and Leadership, um, where I've got a, a fellowship to work specifically on the circular economy. So, so First of all, um, to kind of narrow in our focus, um, our work is focusing particularly on plastics. And I don't know whether any of you have had the, the pleasure of watching this recent Greenpeace film, um, where you can see a visualization on this, this slide about the amount of plastic waste that the UK dumps on other countries. Um, if you watch it for a couple of seconds longer after this still was taken, you see that actually this was the amount of plastic waste the UK dumps on other countries every single day. So, for us that really highlights the magnitude of this this issue especially when you do a bit more reading and you find out that the amount of plastic waste we're producing is only increasing at the moment that if we carry on at this rate the the weight of plastic in the sea is likely to outweigh the weight of fish in the sea by 2050 and also that um since plastic has been produced only nine percent of it of the total amount ever produced has actually been recycled. So this is a, a huge problem um, with, uh, without a solution, um, which meets the scale of the problem that we're facing at the moment. Um, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with the challenges that come with plastic. So we're going to dwell more on what, what, what people are trying to do to solve it and address it. So this is where the idea of the circular economy comes in. Um, and the, the idea is that um, in contrast to the way that we've been um, living over, increasingly living in recent decades where we extract raw materials, produ produce them into an item or an object, some, something useful, um, use it and then dispose of it. Instead, you try and capture those materials and recirculate them um, so that ideally there's zero waste. And there's, there's different ways that you can do that. You can, recycling is one option. Um, and this diagram shows other options, like the return of goods to the person, the company you buy it from, which means that then they can um, re repair it or um, redeploy it in some way. And also a, a kind of much more ideal loop is that things are reused and repaired and, and remanufactured. Um, so there's lots of different ways that <laughs> the vast number of items that we use can be kind of put back into use in some way rather than disposed of. Um, and there's di different ways as well that we can kind of make this, this loop of circularity um, more efficient. So, so Nancy Bocken and her colleagues have kind of conceptualized this you know, very, very simple loop of materials circulating. Um, first of all, you need to close it. So you have this zero waste scenario. Um, secondly, you can narrow that loop. So you've got less materials circulating around. So you can do that by um, reducing the amount of packaging that you use or by, um, by consuming less stuff in the first place. 
there's also um you can also extend the loop so that would be like designing products to last longer um so get rid of any built-in obsolescence which has come in in recent years um, and you can also slow the loop so that individually we're actually using items for much longer um, rather than using them for a short time and disposing of them as as fashions or preferences change so um Currently, like I mentioned, we're, we're really mainly a, a linear economy at the moment. Um, so most of the production and consumption we have follows this take, make, dispose model, um, which, and, and the world's actually only 8.6% circular. So we're not even a 10th circular left yet. The reason why it's worth doing um, is in part to avoid all this pollution from waste, which we highlighted in that second slide. But also um, because linear processes are actually responsible for a, a, a large amount of the CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions that we have today, um, because there's a lot of um, like embodied carbon in the in the products that we use. So if we can solve that and stop losing that from uh, through through these kind of wasteful processes, but we can keep that embodied carbon circulating around, that could really make a huge contribution towards addressing. Um, addressing some of the climate change goals as well. There's also um, potentially a large um, economic benefit that comes along with this, estimated as potentially $4.5 trillion in economic benefits by 2030, um, if, if things roll out in, in an ideal way. Um, and this all kind of contributes very much to the Sustainable Development Goal 12 on responsible consumption and production. So, um, I like this um, advert also by Greenpeace, um, but the, re the reason I'm um, sharing it is actually because it highlights how so far the large focus of work on circular economy has really been on the materials and the material flows much more than um, on the people that, that are handling those flows. So this advert um, or this campaign um, poster saying Coca-Cola is this yours really highlights how um, how plastic materials are traceable um, and you know we can all recognize that coca-cola bottle even without its um without its little sleeve that would normally go around it it's very, very clearly comes from that company whereas the people who are working in these flows um are often less hard to track or trace at the moment um with this this current focus on materials um, and one of the things that safi and i have been arguing is that it's really time to make sure we're thinking about the people um within these processes as well as the pro the material flows themselves so um, this is a, a figure that we, we just designed for a paper that's just been published, um, which shows how um, the focus on um, plastics flows and what's happening to the plastics um, sometimes comes without a focus on, on who's actually handling those plastics. And what we found from uh, largely from literature review work is that actually in in middle and lower income countries, the vast majority of plastic recycling and other waste recycling is goes through the hands of, um, of waste pickers, who are often the people who are least paid, um, working in precarious conditions, um, often without good health and safety, um, and often also stigmatised as well as having um, not very um, not the jobs without many career prospects or without much safety or security associated with them as well. Not, not work that normally we could define as, as decent work, which is the, the standard that we'd aspire to for, for work for everyone. So this, this table just highlights um, like some of that. Um, I think so the, the, sec, the second, the third column, waste picker contribution to recycling shows how in in these major economies, Brazil, Indonesia, Nigeria, and South Africa, the vast majority of recycling passes through the hands of waste pickers. Um, yet they lack equipment, they work for the labor minimum wage, they face potential health hazards from handling medical waste. Um, and and there's, as, as you might expect, there's also um, gender inequality where women tend to earn less than men and also women tend to be the ones who are doing most of the unpaid work within that um, waste recycling system too. So in response, um, what Safi and I have proposed is we need to rethink the circular economy to include people. And a lot of the literature and discussion about circular economy 
focuses on the the aim of kind of making a restorative and regenerative um, uh, economy, which which mean, renews materials and puts them back into good use. Um, and we, we want to kind of take those principles of restoration um, and care um, and being careful with um, with with the with the resources that the people use and also apply them to the people who are working within those processes. Um, so we propose this um, diagram of the, the circular economy to show um, how it's also important to make sure that people have got safe work, that they've got fair pay, that they get social protection, legal rights, voice, recognition, and that they've also got access to education and training and infrastructure and the services that they need. Um, and this is built on the foundations of not exploiting child labour and not exploiting forced labour to, to achieve those goals. So, um, with, along, as, as Safi and I have been doing this work, it's, um, it's been really nice because we've met some small companies that are making big strides in, in, these, in the right direction um, and really applying a lot of these principles um, to the work they're doing. So one example is Eco Bricks in Uganda. And we, at the end of this um, talk, we've just put a link to a short video about them and their work. Um, so what they do is they're, they're recycling plastic in Uganda, which otherwise is often being burnt and causing a lot of localized air pollution, as well as um, air pollution that contributes to, to climate change through greenhouse gases. Um, but they've always had a very, very strong social focus as well. So they ensure that a large number of their workforce is female, um, to make, make sure there's opportunities for women. And they also ensure that um, they employ a, a, a large number of disabled people um, within the workforce as well. Um, they, try, they pay above the market rate for their plastics and they provide uniforms as well. So they've, it's, it's not a completely formalized system. Um, you know, there's pr probably still some, some way to go, but they're really um, actively working to, to improve the opportunities that are available and ensure that the work that comes with um, the post-consumer plastic waste is, is better quality than it has been. Now I'm going to hand over to Safi. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess now we're looking at how companies are moving towards greater plastic circularity in practice. Um, can you change the slide, please? So obviously we've just seen Ecobricks, which is a smaller company, it's a social enterprise. Um, but also large incumbents are vital in um, influencing this change towards a more circular economy. Um, so aside from individual efforts of individual consumers reducing their waste and reducing consumption, smaller companies and both larger companies are vital. Um, and critically, they overlap as well. So many incumbents now are starting to partner with smaller companies such as Ecobricks or um, similar companies who can, who are more innovative and have local expertise. So it's quite a nice co-collaboration in which smaller companies can help larger companies with waste targets. Um, and also large companies can help smaller companies with funding or resources. Um, however, there's a slight kind of critique that possibly large incumbents are almost outsourcing their responsibility to smaller companies um, if this isn't done properly. Um, next slide, please. So we can, next, oh, sorry, Anna, next slide. To the commitments. Ah, lovely. Um, so here are four examples of multinationals in the fast consumer goods or uh, manufacturing and retail um, industries who have recently adopted goals for greater responsibility of plastic pollution. Um, Often these are quite centered on recycling um, and some have intentions for the social as well, which is interesting. Um, as you can see, a lot of the goals are very ambitious um, with commitments by 2025 or 2030. Um, so in order to get to those goals, uh, there are several pathways that companies are following. Um, these are just uh, examples, some that we've researched, but recently there's been a new plastics economy who have launched a global commitment in 2018 uh, with 500 signatories. So it's a growing kind of phenomenon, but lots of companies are coming on board. 
Um, again, a slight critique is that these commitments are possibly acts to avert stronger anti-plastic legislation, such as plastic bans, there's been a lot of those across Africa, um, or response to regulations, such as extended producer responsibility schemes. So I don't know, it depends. They, they might be voluntary, they might not be, um, but anything to drive it forward is always good. Um, next slide, please. So pathways to circular plastics. So once they've got those commitments, how are multinationals trying to reach those goals? Uh, pilot projects is one means by which um, companies are moving towards circularity. So this might be partnering with smaller companies, social enterprises, NGOs um, across different geographic locations to pilot new um, technologies for recycling or at the start of life with new materials. Um, they often involve corporate engagement with lower middle income countries, whereby partnerships are brokered with organizations, community groups and individuals. Um, however, these are yet to be upscaled. Um, I don't think there's one multinational at the moment who's kind of due to different policy contexts and lots of kind of locational different differences. Um, it's understandably quite hard to scale this up very quickly. Um, recycling as a first step, as we've mentioned before, um, while this is obviously a good start for post-consumer recycled plastic waste, whereby companies are collecting recyc re uh, like bottles and plastic packaging at the end of life and using that to create new products um, as opposed to virgin materials, it's, it's a certain sense of responsibility, um, but they are dealing with the waste at the end of life. So we can question, I guess, what about the beginning of life? What about more radical um, pathways to circularity? And partnering to deliver social outcomes. So partnerships, many multinationals have partnerships commercially, so within the supply chain, externally, obviously with these social enterprises, or they may be pre-competitive partnerships with other for example, fast moving consumer goods companies um, with similar ambitions. Next slide, please. Um, so we've done a bit of research um, with three multinationals um, interviewing kind of heads of sustainability and circular economy to see the, which, what those companies who are making a change, what they're doing and how they found it. Um, what are the enablers and the barriers? So the blues are the obstacles and the greens are the enablers. Um, I may, won't read them all out, but these levers can drive, enable or block a company's transition, or they can do all three simultaneously. So for example, policies and regulation, if there are um, regulations on the international shipments of waste, this makes it really hard to create a circular economy for waste across all of their global reach um, but then equally policies can drive circularity for example extended producer responsibility policies which are increasingly growing um, they're termed levers because our findings show that these elements make a difference to the actions of multinational corporations when they define their ambitions based upon the intersection of their corporate culture and values with the wider economic legislative and cultural context in which they operate so knowing what blocks or enables is important to know how to progress um, along that circular pathway. Uh, next slide, please. So that's multinational companies, but what about smaller companies and how are they helping? Um, from our research, a lot of the chats we've had with smaller companies on the ground um, are really interesting because they many have started off with the focus of the waste collectors and from the social side in the first place rather than the plastic problem so dealing with the people who move those flows along rather than simply the materials which is what a lot of the focus with multinationals is on. Um, so Fundacia Novena is a philanthropic foundation across Latin America um, who have started with the workers caring for the people, not just the material. And I think the logo captures this really well um, and their program called Inclusive Recycling. Um, so their vision is that Latin America is at the forefront of a new vision for solid waste management that prioritizes recycling. Um, and a lot of the work 
the waste collecting work is informal. So they've got a vision to formalize the work of millions of grassroots recyclers with green jobs that make a concrete contribution to the development of the circular economy. Um, and this is so important because the amount of informal work across Latin America, especially within the recycling supply chain is vast. Um, so this is a bottom up strategy with collectors playing a key role in decision making, which defies the traditional logic of international aid. Um, and they've had a huge influence in um, changing legislation and gaining recognition by authorities um, as formalized workers and now have identity cards, which means they can open bank accounts um, and become as well as kind of yeah citizens legally they're also accepted more by um other people in their community um so yeah they've really impacted institutional frameworks through this um foundation and they've also obviously strengthened value chains so working the plastic they've collected they partner with um industries who produce plastic and packaging so they're creating a more increased and sustainable supply of recycled material. Uh, next slide, please. And similarly, um, Work and their partner First Mile are a similar smaller company based in Haiti, Taiwan and Honduras. They initially were set up um, in 2010 after the earthquake. Um, and since Haiti are the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, this is really crucial because the initial focus was on ending poverty and undignified jobs, especially that have been so crucially kind of affected by the earthquake. Um, so work is the social side. So they do a lot with medical care, education and job training, identifying those communities um, most in need. And the first mile is a people focused network that strengthens microeconomies. Um, so what we can see here is the kind of the life cycle of what First Mile are doing. So they partner with uh, many, a lot of textile brands, clothing brands like Puma, Ralph Lauren, Converse. Um, so we can see that plastic is collected by waste collectors who um, under much better, fairer working conditions, which are then sorted and cleaned and shredded and turned into a yarn, which is later used to create products with purpose that truly empower the first mile forward. Um, so for example, the Puma and first mile collection consists of shoes and apparel made from recycled yarn. Uh, this has actually diverted over 40 tons of plastic waste from landfills and oceans, just for the products in 2020, uh, which translates to just under 2 million plastic bottles being reused. Um, so yeah, it's a great initiative, both collecting taking uh, plastic out of the environment and producing supply for many brands um, who rely on all sorts of resources. Um, and not only has it done that, it's also developed programming that's curtailed child labor in landfills, undercut bad faith practices like predatory lending and ensured that families can safely make the transition to the formal economy. Um, and hopefully they'll extend this reach further when they can. Um, next slide, please. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of talk about recycling. Is this a distraction from a more ambitious circular economy? So what we can see here is a diagram that Anna and I produced, basically just showing that recycling is the outermost, least desirable loop of the circular economy. Um, it requires the least change. This is also taken from Ken Webster, who's a big thinker on circular economy um, and he's kind of brought attention to this idea that why is recycling being the focus when there is much more radical pathways to circularity that um, especially multinationals should be taking when they've got such a large influence. Um, so yeah why is recycling least desirable because it requires more processing labour, energy and new materials than other circular processes um, the end product is usually of less value than its predecessor. Recycling low value materials is less financially viable when oil is cheap. And this is crucial because um, oil can obviously go up and down in price. So the virgin material of virgin plastic can become a lot cheaper. 
um, and recovered materials that are contaminated or, for example, made of mixed um, plastic, maybe diverted to landfill, incinerated or exported, so obviously causing huge knock-on effects for uh, the environment and societies where those plastics are ending up if they aren't recovered. Um, so yeah, and then we've got the inner loops. So we've got refurbish and repair, reuse, reduce, and obviously refuse is the most ideal. Um, but I guess the argument is that by focusing just on recycling, as we've seen in a lot of these commitments, um, is it enough to create systemic change? Probably not. Um, but obviously it's a good start. Um, change slide, please. And just to kind of state again that it is these huge companies that are that have such a great global influence i'm not sure if you can see in the brackets but it shows their kind of global reach and how many companies they're operating in um so these companies are all part of the alliance to end plastic waste which is a non-governmental and non-profit organization which has over 80 member countries companies um but yeah, so they've promised to spend 1.5 billion by 2024 in reducing plastic pollution, increasing recycling efforts. So again, a huge focus on recycling and not so much on radical um, disturbing of the kind of linear economy and uh, beginning of life of plastic, essentially. It's just focusing on the clear up. They also um, taking the collective companies involved in the Alliance to End Plastic Waste have invested 186 billion in new petrochemical facilities which um, produce plastic. So there's a bit of kind of contradiction with the members, which is interesting to note. Um, and yeah, they've just been criticized for promoting a reduction of plastic waste rather than a reduction in plastic production. Um, and then also there are re there's been a recent emergence of industry alliances in certain regions. So, for example, FBRA, is, it's the Food and Beverage Recycling Association in Nigeria, and Gripe is a similar one in Ghana, who are also constituted of similar companies, um, food and beverage, fast moving consumer goods, again, with um, a high focus on post consumer packaging waste recovery rather than any other more kind of disruptive modes of circularity. Um, yeah, thank you. Passing on to Anna again. Oh, I think you're muted. I just, just unmute myself. Um, thank you, Safi. Thank you very much. So I, I just want to um, wrap up with a few um, concluding thoughts um, based on what Safi has just presented. So firstly, um, what, what we've seen really um, struck, sorry, can you still see my slide? Can you still, Safi, can you still, still see the slides? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, so yes, yeah, so first of all, what we've seen um, is that there seems to be a real tendency to aim for the low hanging fruit um, in terms of recycling, because as Safi described, it's, well, it's, the least ambitious form of circularity it's also the least disruptive to existing linear businesses because it it's a they can continue very much with the same processes that they had before tweaking things along the way in a relatively minor way but there's no big kind of redesign of how do you actually run these systems um especially when they're working with um with smaller companies or ngos or foundations um and actually basically subcontracting them to to do a lot of that um plastic collection work, um, as well as kind of take responsibility for some of the social um, goals alongside the environmental goals that they're aiming for. So um, what, we're, not, we're not saying it's bad that they're doing this. Clearly, there's a huge clear up, clean up operation needed. Um, but this, the, this parallel fact that some of those same companies are still um, producing huge amounts of plastic waste and pumping it into the, um, into the world every single day means that there's a, still quite a big um, imbalance. And I guess another point is just that while some of the leading companies are really kind of getting on board with um, like making thinner plastic packaging or working towards recycling, there's a lot that aren't doing this as well. 
So um, we're still kind of really in the early days of trying to find a, a good solution to this um, and to make sure it's adopted widely. So, so there's nothing wrong with doing the easy thing first, in, in my view, um, but it, should, it must be done in combination with a long-term strategy for really knowing where you're going next and what the, what the, what the kind of more ambitious goal is with a strong sense of, kind of how you're going to reach those more ambitious goals as well. Obviously, if we start the, the type of disruption that we're, we're talking about in terms of um, re redesigning systems, um, producing less that's thrown away and cycling more things around. And this really needs a focus on, on what happens to jobs when, if you do this. Um, think about the, the mines that might not be needed. So we end up using our, um, our, our tin or our, our other um, metals more efficiently and reusing them and reusing them. Um, so there's there's all sorts of things that could shift um, in terms of where work's available. So this it doesn't mean it shouldn't be changed, but it just means that has to be paid attention to um, to ensure that there's there's a social transition and a just transition alongside the um, the environmental changes that are needed. So yeah, so, so and, and these things must be designed in right from the beginning. So jobs, gender equality, and redistribution um, need to be designed in because you could have a a materials-based circular economy, which is um, very efficient um, and very good environmentally, but actually socially damaging because it could be highly extractive. So all those things need to, the social dimensions need to be thought in, which is often often missed. And lastly, for companies that are are going circular at the moment, um, we've heard quite a lot. We can't do it alone. There's no way that we can achieve this with materials that do company to the company from hand to hand um, they because these materials move between lots lots of different organizations and individuals it has to be done um, together in collaboration just before um, I finish I, I'd just like to um, also reflect on what what we can do um, now because i know that a lot of this talk um we focused on what companies are doing and and i think companies have got a major role to play of course governments have got a huge role to play as well in terms of making legislation and enforcing that legislation to make sure that change and we found in our work that policy really makes a massive push towards um making things change quickly at scale um and it, it absolutely can't be overlooked one thing um <laughs> that I often object to is quite often um, individual behaviours blamed. So um, people are blamed for not knowing how to handle their plastic waste properly or for throwing it on the floor or not, not recycling. Um, and while in some places there's, there's some infrastructure to deal with this, in many parts of the world um, there isn't really infrastructure to deal with the amount of plastic waste which is arriving um, in the shops or on the streets. So um, I, I think um, this kind of rhetoric that, oh, it's the fault of the consumer who can't deal with their, their waste properly really needs to be carefully considered or reconsidered. Um, that said, um, um, uh, some of you will have noticed that one of the one of the levers that Safi identified was actually market demand. And market demand does come ultimately from us. Um, and I think as individuals, as citizens or consumers, depending on who, what, fra what framing you're using, um, so I think there are things that we can do. We don't need to feel totally disempowered that the government's not doing something or that the companies aren't changing because there are plenty of options out there for, um, for reducing the amount of plastic in our lives. So I'm not saying this to be um, evangelical any, anyway, but just to say that there, there are ways to introduce circularity into our own daily lives and to reduce that um, plastic waste so that we don't end up leaving this talk feeling slightly disempowered that, um, that we don't have the believe us necessarily ourselves to, to make the changes that are needed. So um, <laughs> you've heard this a few times now, but re refusing um, unnecessary um, packaging or unnecessary goods and reducing what we um, use can means that we can change change where the, um, where the consumer demand is within the market um, and show that the new markets and growing markets are actually the ones that are more sustainable. Um, I also think it's important to demand change um, well, you know, if people don't know that we want change, then it's hard to, sometimes they don't feel confident to, to make those changes. Because for, for companies that are embarking on something new, they need the confidence 
um, that it's going to work for their company as well. So if they get reassured, it, it helps a great deal. Um, reusing and repairing things um, can potentially create a huge number of new jobs and quite a lot of the type of jobs that we actually used to have, um, you know, cobblers and, um, and such like where or seamstresses where you could get things fixed. Um, you know, it's, it's not so hard to imagine returning to, to much more reuse and repair and that a repair cafe seem to be springing up around the place now. Um, and then thinking also about how, how systems can be used to redistribute more um, equitably between people and restore the people and resources um, in, in our economy. Um, I, think my, I think my last point is, I know we've had a bit of a, um, a criticism of recycle, recycling throughout this conversation today, um, but that isn't to say that um, we should stop recycling, of course, our, our message isn't that, it's just that recycling isn't enough on its own. So um, I think that would be my final comment would be that we should we should keep keep recycling too. Um, just in case um, anyone is interested in following up on on some of the things we've said, um, there's a there's a nice um, short film about EcoBricks, the Ugandan um, organization we've been working with um, on RETV. Um, there's also Safi and I and my new paper, um, which just came out recently. Um, and the, the film by Greenpeace, Wasteminster, is very, very, very short um, and very um, impactful as well. So I'll, we're very happy to take some questions and I'll leave you with this nice photograph of our college um, a couple of months ago when it was really looking particularly beautiful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Safi, and thank you, Anna. That was very, very uh, informative. Um, if anybody's got questions, please put them in through the, the chat. Um, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, you, you have talked about something I was going to ask about, which is sort of what we as individuals can do. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on, on any other pressure we could put on companies that particularly work in this country, for example, Unilever? Um, and you know, writing to them to sort of say, you know, I'm a consumer, I use your washing powder, you know, would you please use less packaging in it or other, other, other methods like that? So Jane, I'm, I'm smiling because my fellowship's actually funded by Unilever. Um, so I can, I can pass a message on directly um, at, at some point as well, if, if you like. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, I actually think it helps increase their confidence to shift in that direction. Um, to to make that point, so I think it, I think it's a, a great idea. Um, there's also I was just looking up, you know, what what different recommendations there are, or different ways that people can kind of get together and do things collectively. And um, Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund, um, they they have um, it depends it depends what your thing is. Um, they've got a series of the WWF have got some challenges that you can do um, in terms of how to kind of live a lower impact lifestyle. Because of course some stuff is kind of provided to us by the um, by our wider infrastructure, um, and there's other stuff that we can just tweak in our own lives, which can actually make make quite quite a quick change quite quite easily. I think the challenge is to how do you carry on living a life which is um, you know still well integrated in society while also making those changes. But I, I definitely yeah I definitely agree, Jane. Like, you know getting getting involved, writing to writing to politicians, writing to to companies. Um, my, my, the poor people at my local um, village shop are probably fed up with me asking when they're going to stop wrapping all the fruit and vegetable in plastics. Um, mm -hmm. but, but so far the answer is no. So I also think um, doing it, but not doing it on your own because a single voice isn't always strong enough. So doing it together with other people um, can sometimes help. I might have, yeah, I might ideas. Yeah. Well, um, there are, especially for younger people, um, social platforms are actually very powerful and I'm, I've seen so many petitions going around lately um, and I think they do help. I know the Greenpeace sent out a kind of emailed out a petition to anyone who subscribes to them and I think it's available on Facebook and stuff as well and after that Wasteminster short clip um, it actually had an impact and they emailed to say that their petition was actually very influential and Turkey of now so a lot of our waste exports that used to go to Asia um, have recently gone to Turkey and Turkey have now um, banned almost all exports from the UK. 
Um, so it's nice to hear that <laughs> petitions can make a difference as well. And just, yeah, tiny things um, that you probably don't think one voice can make a difference from when they're collective, they can. I just go back one slide as well. Like, these are a few of the um, life hacks that I found recently. Like, how that? What are the easy things that you can do to to be a bit more circular in your own life um, without um, without making anything that feels like a compromise? Actually, so um, you can buy secondhand clothes from the Oxfam website, um, deliver to your doorstep, um, and much more shop, much more choice than a traditional. Um, Oxfam shop because you've got the whole um, the whole range of different things on the internet. Um, vegetable boxes delivered to your door come with very little um, plastic packaging compared to the equivalent from the supermarket. These nice little coloured things that look like meringues are actually solid soap and sorry, solid shampoo, um, which is um, which is great. It works really well in my um, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and then on the far right, there's um, the example of refill stations, which you can do for um, food goods as well as um, cleaning products and hand gel and, and all sorts of things as well. So the, I think the issue is that the, all this stuff that I've, that I've kind of <laughs> laid out there is not the mainstream. So you have to go looking a little bit to find those things, but, um, but they are out there um, and, and provide really good options and really good alternatives. And I guess, I guess in a way that's where, where we're starting to change demand, um, change the nature of demand if we, if we choose different things, it kind of sends those market signals um, to the, the people who make the decisions about which direction to take the company in. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anna and Safria. We don't seem to have many questions coming in, just some thanks um, through, the, through the chat. Um, so I think I'll draw the session to a close. Thank you so much to I both just, of you. Oh, and, I, just um, you. I just wanted to say um, that the, there was one that said, are companies such as First Mile, et cetera, profitable or are they subsidized? Um, and if so, whom? I know First Mile is for profit, but the company they work with work is completely not for profit. Um, and then, for example, Fundacion Avena is a philanthropic organization. So I know a lot of their, or at least one of their um, inclusive recycling programs was funded by the Gates Foundation. Um, so they do rely on kind of external sources of funding. And then that's brilliant. There's also this um, message from Hubbub um, saying, um, so thank you for the nice comment that we did a nice lecture. So thank you for listening and thank you for coming. Um, but we can find Hubbub on social media um, where they've got lots of um, tips on lower impact living. So, um, so do go beyond my tiny, um, my tiny range of things, because there's there, are, like like this person says, there's so many ways that you can kind of tweak your life. Um, and I think when you're when you're doing that more and more um, with others, the, the kind of the impact spreads as well. And um, there's a question also about TerraCycle. They seem very opaque and ask people basically to create individual streams for recycling. Safi, I think you looked into TerraCycle more than I did. I don't know whether you'd like to um, comment on that. If, if that's so essentially you can things like um nespresso coffee cups or like parcel washing up liquids I, th I this might not be the right thing um and like packaging that is uh like ldp so it's not normally recyclable if it's flexible um you can kind of save them up in your home and then take them either TerraCycle will i don't think they do like home delivery uh, but you can take it to TerraCycle drop-offs and they'll recycle them for you. And even I think like Holland and Barrett do them um, and places like that. Um, but in terms of individual schemes, I think, yeah, so it's kind of, yeah, for household items, I guess, that you wouldn't normally be able to recycle. It's quite a good kind of method. It is really um, interesting, isn't it? How do you create these, um, the logistics for... The, the loops to return materials um, back to the place where they need to be to be redeployed. So like going back to my veg box, which maybe isn't the most um, exciting example, but you know, they, the same people take the same box back at the end, the end of the week, and then they have it there in their hands ready to use again. So for me, I really like that because you're not, 
you're not even <laughs> good. I'm glad you like a good veg box, me too. Um, so, uh, for, you know, the, that, the kind of going back to that critique of recycling, you know, it, it doesn't really seem to make sense for, to me in many cases. Like this, this glass bottle I've been drinking from, I'll put that in a recycling bin. It will have to be melted down um, and then reformed into a new bottle, which is very energy inefficient, I think, compared to just, um, just simply washing it. Um, well and then reusing it which is something that people used to do before so I think I think a lot of this <laughs> a lot of this stuff is um it's not rocket science it's a lot of um logistics um and in some part looking back to what we've done before um and I think yeah I think these kind of recycling schemes are, are quite good um and it's, it's interesting to see how they're built onto existing networks but maybe you've got some more you want to share with us about TerraCycle. Um, it sounds like maybe you've looked into them more than we have. Right, okay. Well, I think I'll, I will draw it to a close now. <laughs> so thank you to both of you for a really, really interesting informative talk. Um, I hope we can all go away and uh, do something different. I've tried the uh, the um, uh, solid shampoos and I can vouch for them as well. They work. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for coming and uh, we look forward to um, perhaps hearing more from you another time on one of your other topics, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>